Today, but before we get to that, uh, today we come to our so setting up the wise man, uh, the wise men did something rather unique. He was placing fireman's hats on each one of them. On those, the wise men came from afar. <laughs> Three husbands. 
husbands. What? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> so, we do know, however, that there were more than one wise man because uh, the plural is used to describe the magi here in the text. So we do know that. The real story that we encounter in Matthew 2 is a tale of two kings. And we'll meet them both in just a moment. A tale of two kings, a tale of one little town, a tale of three gifts, and three <laughs> responses to the king of kings who is presented to us and who is worthy of our worship. He is the one to seek. He is the one to worship. He is the one who is worth everything. When we talk about 2020 vision, he is our vision. He is the one that we are looking for, waiting for, hoping for, loving, serving. His smile is all that we seek. So let's get into this. First of all, in Matthew chapter 2, as we encounter, there we go, one little town. One little town. Matthew 2 and verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, stop there. Jesus was born where? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And it's important to note that it's Bethlehem of Judea, because there's another Bethlehem, that area of Galilee, uh, which many readers at this time might have been familiar with. This is Bethlehem of Judea. And what do we know from Scripture about Bethlehem? We encounter Bethlehem in the book of Ruth. We're reminded that the very name means house of bread. And in the days of Ruth and Naomi, uh, ironically, there was no bread in the house of bread. There was no bread in the house of bread. So they exited the land, not trusting in God, and they went to Moab. They went to Moab. All right, we all with me still? Okay. So uh, they went to Moab to look for bread, because there was no bread in the house of bread. But more famous than that story, who is from Bethlehem? It's known as the city of David. The city of David, yes, exactly, the city of David. So this is highlighted for us, especially uh, in the angel Gabriel's announcement to Mary. If you look at Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin, betrothed a man whose name was Joseph, and it goes on, and he greets Mary, and do not be afraid, and all of that. Verse 32, he will be great, this is Jesus, the child will be born, a son will be given, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So we see that this child is going to be a son of David. And so it's important that he is born in the city of David. Because there's an ancient prophecy way back in Micah. Way back in Micah that speaks of this. So if you look at Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And we will consider this uh, in just a, a moment as well. But it says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by no means least among the rulers of Judah, this is how Matthew quotes it, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So Bethlehem is the place where this king, this coming Messiah, is to be born. So Bethlehem plays a unique and very special role. So this one little town called Bethlehem, say that with me. Bethlehem. One little town, Bethlehem. It's the city of David. It's the birthplace of the coming king. And anybody who knew anything about Messianic prophecy would know that Bethlehem is where this guy is supposed to be born. In fact, in Jesus' ministry, he was known as a Nazarene, which was rather a humbling sort of title to have. And on at least one occasion, probably more that we don't even have record of, some of the Pharisees and scribes and his detractors said, well, wait a minute, this guy can't possibly be uh, the Messiah who was to come. We all know the Messiah comes from Bethlehem, the city of David. This guy is from Nazareth. As one of his own disciples said when hearing about Jesus for the first time, Nazareth, what good thing can come from Nazareth? Uh, we know from history that there was a Roman garrison in Nazareth. It wasn't a very popular place, kind of a small backwater place in Galilee. The Messiah comes from Bethlehem. Where is Jesus born? Bethlehem, just as the prophets wrote. So, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the days of Herod the king. So we encounter two kings here in Matthew chapter 2. First of all, there's Herod the Great. Everybody say that with me. Herod the Great. And who's the second king? Who do you think the second king is? 
Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. Excellent. Give Margaret a big round of applause. That was great. So we got Herod the Great and Jesus the Christ. And Matthew is going to highlight the kingship of Jesus. In fact, he already has done so in his genealogy at the beginning of the gospel, specifically showing uh, the legal descent of Jesus from King David, how he fulfills the promise to Abraham, that Abraham's descendants will be a blessing to the whole world. Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. Jesus is legally in the line of King David. There's a really uh, unique aspect of this that uh, Jesus is in the legal line of David. Joseph, the descendant of David. Of course, Mary is the mother of Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes upon her. The one reborn of her is holy, the Son of God. And Joseph, when he names Jesus at the end of Matthew chapter 1, is essentially legally adopting Jesus. And that's important because uh, as Matthew describes in Matthew chapter 1, verse 11, uh, Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation uh, to Babylon, there is a curse that is pronounced upon his line that no biological descendant of his will ever sit upon the throne ever again. And so we wonder to ourselves, how can this be? Jesus is the legal descendant from King David, and yet he is not descend uh, biologically from the curse of Jeconiah. So that's a pretty cool fact from history and how all of this works together according to God's great plan. So as the genealogy concludes in Matthew 1, verse 16, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. He is the Christ. So we have one little town of Bethlehem. We have two great kings, Herod the Great and Jesus the Christ. Which one is the greater king? Let's consider Herod for just a moment. Just a moment, Herod the king. Uh, Herod is an illegitimate king. He is not in the line of David. In fact, he's only king because of his political connections in Rome. Uh, he went to Rome uh, many a few years before he became king of the region of Judea and regions around there. He went to Rome, and he made a lot of good friends there. And the Roman Senate said, hey, if you go back and you conquer that area, this is around AD 40, you go back and conquer that area of Judea, you can reign. And so it took about three years to establish his kingship and his reign. By AD 37, uh, he becomes the king of that region. He's called Herod the Great uh, because he reigned for many, many years. He's called Herod the Great because of his many incredible building projects. Uh, he built, what are some of the places he built? Uh, Caesarea Maritima, which is a wonder of the ancient world. He built Masada. Uh, he built uh, incredible, incredible places. But what's the most incredible thing, incredible building project of Herod the Great that wasn't completed until several decades after his death? Anybody know? It's in Jerusalem. It was destroyed not long after it was completed. The temple. The temple, the most incredible, uh, incredible wonder uh, that, that he built. And so he's called Herod the Great because of the geographical reign, because of the way he took power, because of the building projects that he did, because of the length of his reign. But also, he was known to be cruel and ruthless. He was a nasty, nasty guy, a firm ruler. But more than that, he was a ruthless murderer who would... It didn't matter who you were. If he felt you were a threat to his throne, he was going to get rid of you and do away with you. He had a wife killed. He had his own sons killed, relatives, rivals, officials killed. He was the kind of guy always looking over his shoulder. And if he was suspicious of you, that perhaps you had an eye on his throne and were fomenting a rebellion, you better watch out or run for your life because Herod the Great is a ruthless cruel man who is going to come and take you out. In fact, one account says that when he was nearing death, and by the way, he died from a horrible, painful sort of disease, and some uh, people of his day, many people thought he was being judged for his wicked acts as king. Uh, at the time of his death, as he knew it was approaching, he had many of the notable people in Jerusalem and the surrounding area gathered up in like the Hippodrome, which is kind of like a, a public's um, uh, spectacle sort of place, had them gathered up so that at the moment he died they would be slaughtered so that people throughout the land would be in mourning and crying at the time of his death because he knew no one was going to mourn and weep and wail for him. Isn't that, can you imagine a person that despicable? 
mean, this, this guy is in the, in the same line as, uh, as horrible people like you know, Joseph Stalin, these kind of rulers. I mean, just a horrible, despicable kind of guy. So that's, that's Herod. Is he a legitimate king? No, he is no. an illegitimate king. And then we have another king who's introduced to us. Here is where the story gets really interesting. Matthew 2 and verse 1. The days of Herod the king. Behold, wise men or magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, we could spend a long time talking about where they came from, but most people think they probably came from the region of Babylon. And if you want to read more about these kind of wise men, astronomers, astrologers, well-read sort of people, obviously they consulted many different prophecies and religious writings and all these sorts of things. Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2 describes Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the other wise men that were around at his time, probably in the same line as these guys are the wise men who come from the east. And they said, when they got to Jerusalem, to Herod, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Ooh, how do you think Herod felt about that? Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, they're coming from outside of Roman jurisdiction, and they're coming uh, perhaps as a threat from the Parthians, or who knows what, but they're coming, and he's going, what are you talking about? The king of the Jews? I'm the king of the Jews. He had killed, murdered, slaughtered, worked hard, ruled with an iron fist to establish himself as king. And now they're saying that one has been born king of the Jews. For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, why would they associate this astronomical sign, this star, with the birth of a king? Numbers 24-17. Numbers 24-17. Of all people, it's the, the prophet Balaam who is prophesying here. But they must have had access to his writings, because in Numbers 24 and verse 17, we read Balaam's final oracle, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And many people of this day uh, thought of Numbers 24, 17 as describing the Messiah, the king who is to come. And indeed, that is how the wise men interpreted this verse. They saw this astronomical sign in the sky, this star, and they interpreted it in light of Numbers 24, 17. And so they came to Judea, to the capital city, because isn't that where a king should be? He should be in the palace. They probably thought Herod knew all about this. And they were probably rather surprised, as Herod was shocked, that Herod had no idea what they were talking about. Now, he might have had no idea about this specific sign, but plenty of people of his day were caught up in the messianic fervor and the excitement and the wonder and the questions. And this must have gotten him even more on it. Verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem was troubled with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So the chief priests are in charge of the temple. What happens there? The scribes, what kind of stuff would they do? What do you think they were in charge of? They were in charge of teaching, interpreting scriptures writing and making sure that there were copies of the scriptures, all that kinds of thing. They were the official uh, keepers of the law and teachers of the people, includes Pharisees and people like that. He inquired of them where the Christ, the anointed king, was to be born. And this is like prophecy 101. I mean, they all knew exactly where the king was supposed to be born. Not a king, Bethlehem. And they all quoted Matthew, Micah 5 and verse 2, as found in Matthew chapter 2. Bethlehem of Judea, king. It says right here, Micah 5, verse 2. And you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. And imagine as he's listening to this, probably a fake smile on his face. Ah, a ruler, shepherd. Ah, I'm the ruler of the people. I'm supposed to be the shepherd. Shepherd, of course, ties his king directly with David, who was the shepherd of God's people. David himself was humble, a man after God's own heart. He recognized that only the Lord is the true shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, said David, the shepherd king. Uh, Herod is not 
not liking any of this. And so he says, hey, hey guys, how about we go and have a little sidebar? Maybe he takes them out of the, the public conversation with the scribes and the chief priests, and they go off to a private room. I love the scene in the Nativity Story movie. How many of you have seen the Nativity Story movie? We watch it every year as a family. I'm not everything about it is completely historically accurate, but there's a scene in there where, where Herod and his family are eating dinner with the wise men, and they're sort of relaxing with them while they are grilling them about the time of all of this. And he ascertains from them secretly what time the star had appeared. Why did he do that? Why did he do well, a really sad part of the story that we're not going to go into great depth in tonight. Uh, later on, this evil, wicked, cruel, and ruthless king, in order to hold on to his reign, is going to ascertain from the wise when that star appeared within the last two years. And so he is going to have every baby boy of Bethlehem in the surrounding region, two years old and younger, slaughtered. Can you imagine the type of person? that would do that. All of them slaughtered. And I don't know if it ties together at all, but archaeologists tell us that in, um, in the, the church in Bethlehem, where many people think sits upon the place where Jesus was born, we're not sure if that's the case or not, but underneath that are many, many human remains, and, and some think that those are the remains of the children that were killed. A really, really terrible, sad, and a horrific <laughs> event that Herod enacts. God, of course, protects Jesus, because in a dream he warns, well, we'll get to that in just a moment. All right, verse 7. So Herod uh, ascertains them when the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem. And Herod says to them, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, well, just come back here and bring me word that I too may go and worship him. Was that Herod's intention? No. No, he did not want to go and worship the child. He wanted to go and take him out. He wanted to go and get rid of this threat to his kingdom. After listening to the king, verse 9, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Now, Bethlehem is not that far from Jerusalem, five to six miles, something like that. So this is not your average, ordinary kind. Star. Some people think, oh, it was an alignment of three planets in the sky, or it was a comet, and they, they trace it to some astronomical event on the record books from AD 6 or, or for B, 6 BC or something like that. You know, that's really interesting, and maybe one day, you know, uh, when we get to heaven, I believe these guys will be there. They were worshiping Jesus, and uh, we can ask them, hey, what was that star all about? Can you, can you describe it a little bit more to us? But I believe this is a supernatural uh, phenomenon, uh, you know, sort of on par with the pillar of fire by night or the pillar uh, of cloud by day that the people were led by in the wilderness that led them where God wanted them to go. Because we're, we're talking five or six miles. The star appears to them again and guides them to Bethlehem and rests over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. When they saw this manifestation, this epiphany, this revelation of God to them, showing them the way to the Savior, showing them the way to salvation, to the one true King. I love that description. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. How many of you this Christmas season, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you this Christmas season experienced that kind of joy? Rejoiced exceedingly, superabundantly, with great joy. This kind of joy is found only in Jesus. It's not found in the stuff of this world. It's not found in relationships. It's not found in Christmas presents underneath the tree. It's certainly not found in all the junk of the 12 days of Christmas, right? And who wants that stuff? <laughs> uh, I don't think. Exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house. Uh oh wait a minute. I, I thought uh, they went to the manger scene. You know, I thought, well, what about that picture that we're so familiar with of, you know, Mary and Joseph and maybe Jesus there in the manger scene, and you've got the, uh, the shepherds and the sheep, and there's the wise men, and the, oh, look, there's the star right there. No, that's just all kind of placing everything together. Remember, Jesus is probably, you know, a 
year and a half old by now. It describes him not as a baby, but as a, as a child with Mary, his mother. And they're, they're living in a house. And they fell down. And how did they respond to Jesus? How did they respond to Jesus the Christ? What does it say? They worshipped him. They worshipped him. In fact, that was the whole reason why they were seeking him. We often say wise men still seek him. But we ought to say wise men still worship him. I believe that seeking him first and worshiping him are very similar ideas. To worship him is to place him first and foremost, to ascribe to him the worth of which he and he alone is worthy. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And these wise men, these magi, these very wealthy, learned men from the east that have come all the way to find this child that is born, with their very expensive gifts, they worship him. Falling on their knees, they bow before him, they worship him, and they open up their treasures and offer him gifts. And so we have one little city. What little town? Bethlehem. We have two kings. Who are they? Herod the Great and Jesus the Christ. And we have three gifts. What are they? Gold, which is fit for a king. Frankincense for God and human flesh, and myrrh for the Savior of the world. This is where we turn to our wonderful song, our wonderful Christmas carol, We Three Kings. I love verses 2, 3, and 4 as they're found in the books. Page 197. It says, Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again. King forever, ceasing never, over us all. He is the king of kings. And so they bring him the gift of gold. Frankincense. Frankincense to offer have I. Incense owns a deity nigh. He is God in the flesh. The word made flesh. Prayer and praising all men raising. Worship him God on high. Myrrh. Myrrh is what we know as a spice used in burial. Myrrh is what Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus used as recorded in John's Gospel when they wrapped the body of Jesus after he died on the cross for our sins and he was placed in a cold, dark tomb. Myrrh is the spice that was used. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume breathes a life of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone-cold tomb. And so myrrh foreshadows for us Jesus, the Savior of the world, who would give his life as a sacrifice in our place and on our behalf at Calvary. In just a few moments, we're going to remember that sacrifice as we take the bread, which reminds us of his body broken for us, as we drink from the cup, which reminds us of his blood, which was shed, his blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sin. He is the once for all final sacrifice for our sin. He said upon the cross, it is finished. It is paid in full. And he accomplished all that was necessary for our salvation. So we have these three gifts. And by the way, does the story of Jesus end in a cold, dark tomb? No, it does not. Verse 5 of our song says, Glorious now behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. King and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, earth to heaven replies. Star of wonder, star of night, star of royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding. Guide us to thy perfect light. Jesus is that perfect light, the light of the world. So we have one little town. What is it? We have two kings. Who are they? Herod and Jesus. And we have three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, there's one more thing I want you to notice from our story here in Matthew 2. <laughs> Anything else? Is that not enough? <laughs> no, I just asked him. I just asked him, Jason. Being warned in his dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. 
I would encourage you to continue reading through Matthew chapter 2 and keep reading through uh, the Gospel of Matthew. You'll find so many cool things about how Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecies, how he and his parents flee to Egypt to escape uh, the persecutions under Herod the Great, and how God calls his true son Jesus out of Egypt, and how Joseph, the man of God, the faithful one, is so responsive to the, the visions and dreams of the Lord that God gives to him in obedience, immediately uh, obeying what God has called him to do. You'll read of the heinous, terrible, cruel act of Herod killing the children, and of how God protects Jesus, and of how he eventually ends up in Nazareth, where he grows up and is called a Nazarene. Now, in our story in Matthew 2, 1 through 12, not only do we see these three gifts, but we also see three responses to Jesus. And many writers have written of this over the years, but did you notice the three responses? How did the scribes and the chief priests and the people of the city respond to news of this king? They, they were stirred up, alarmed, talkative, you know, <coughs> excited, much like many of us watching our you know, political news channels and the, looking through all the headlines and getting excited about everything that's going on in our world today. But ultimately, these groups were indifferent. They didn't take any action. They got caught up in the excitement initially. But did the scribes and the chief priests and the people of Jerusalem walk out of the gates and take the not-so-long walk over to Bethlehem to check out what the Magi were talking about? Not as recorded for us here. They seem to be plain indifference. I mean, they were waiting for the Messiah. They knew the prophecies of his birth. And yet, when the sign was given, when the epiphany, the light shone in heaven above, darkness didn't want any part of it. They were indifferent to it. And this is the dumbest response anybody can make to Jesus. To just be indifferent to him. The fact that you're here tonight tells me you're not all that indifferent to Jesus. But there are a lot of people in our world today. Well, oh, Jesus claims to be King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Well, that's good for you. I'm glad that helps you out. I'm glad it's a good crutch that you can lean on when you're going through difficult times. But, you know, I just don't really need any of that. They just said, you know, good for you. That's your truth. Oh, man, I hate that saying. That's your truth. I got my own truth. <laughs> what? <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> maybe, somebody can, maybe somebody can explain that to me. I don't know. But a lot of people in our world today are indifferent to Jesus. And hear me well. We don't, when our kids were little, we never let them use words like stupid or dumb. But that is stupid and that is dumb <laughs> to be indifferent to the claims of Jesus. Now, there's a second response here, and that's from Herod the Great. And Herod, while obviously his response was wicked, evil, and cruel, at least he shows the wisdom to take the claims about this king seriously. Hostility. Hostility to Jesus. He rightfully recognized that this king who was born in Bethlehem was, was hostile to his intentions of maintaining his own reign, maintaining his own kingship. He recognized that this king was a usurper over his throne. At least that's how he saw it. He recognized that this king was a threat to his own kingship. And you say, oh man, I really wish the political leaders in Washington, D.C. or Springfield or City Hall, I really wish that they would get that. Jesus is the one really in charge. But, but let me zero in on me and you. Because we constantly want to sit on the throne of our lives. And Jesus says, I am king. I am Lord. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, dare call themselves a Christian, a follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You know what taking up your cross daily means? It means every single day you wake up and you say, I am dying to myself and living for Jesus. In view of God's mercy, we present our very bodies as living sacrifices, which is our right response of worship to all that he has done for us. So Jesus' proclamation of kingship, Jesus' birth, is a threat to our own reign over our lives. Because Jesus didn't come just to be included in your life. Jesus came to take over. Jesus came to take over. 
so what is the rightful response then? Certainly not the indifference of Jerusalem, certainly not the hostility of Herod. You know, by the way, Herod's response is the same response of the demons. Uh, they know the truth about Jesus. They know the reality of Jesus' reign, and so they are hostile to him, and they are against him. Worship. This is the appropriate response. Who in our story worships King Jesus? Gentiles from the East. We call it epiphany because it's the epiphany, the manifestation of God's grace to the Gentiles that we celebrate. If you're a Gentile Christian, you might want to call your boss and say, hey, tomorrow's January 6th, it's epiphany, it's a big day for me, I'm not coming in. You know, and they might say, okay, don't come in the next day because you're quiet. Maybe that's not so good. But it's a, this is a big deal. This is a really big deal, and they get it right. They get it right. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. The majority were indifferent to him. The leaders, like Herod, were hostile towards him. Will you be among those who worship him, who seek him? The prophet said many, many years before, seek the Lord while he may be. Seek the Lord while he may be. Today is the day of salvation. It's the first Sunday of a new year, the first Sunday of a new decade. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may find compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And to those of you who are following Jesus, Jesus says to you, seek Ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. For about eight, nine years ago, we started thinking about 2020, and we said, hey, let's develop a 2020 vision. And it was pretty neat as we were dreaming about some things for the year 2020. It's hard to believe now that the year 2020 is already here. Some of the things that we envisioned for our church, you know, have not happened. Other things that we envision for our church are happening, and that's really, really exciting. And so you wonder what part of our vision was our own vain glory, and what part of our vision was, you know, what God was laying upon our hearts for the future. But as you develop your 2020 vision, your desires, your resolutions, whatever you call them for this new year, boy, you can just encapsulate it all to that. Seek first the kingdom of God Amen. and his righteousness. And all these things, all the things that you truly need will be given to you as well, will be added to you as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Wise men still seek him. Wise women still seek him. Wise people worship Jesus. That is the appropriate response, the one I pray you have taken this evening. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for your word to us today. Thank you most of all for the Word made flesh, Jesus our Savior. May none of us leave here today indifferent to His indifferent to His proclamations, indifferent to His statements about Himself. For He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We are told of Jesus, there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. We cannot be indifferent about him. Either we are for him or we are against him. God, if there are any who are against him, oh, I pray. I pray that they will turn. I pray that they will turn before it is too late. I pray that they will turn and worship Jesus, that they will repent from their sins, that they will trust in Jesus as their Savior, that they'll call out to him for salvation. And for those of us who do worship Jesus, other things in our lives are constantly demanding first place. We are constantly wanting to crawl in the driver's seat and take control. We are constantly wanting to crawl back onto the throne of our life and displace Jesus and his rightful rule and reign. We are constantly being drawn to the idols of this world and the idols of self and the idols of success and materialism and fame or notoriety or whatever it may be. God, help us constantly, daily, seeking your kingdom and your righteousness, putting Christ Jesus first. This is our 
prayer that we might be among the wise who worship him. And even now, if you are here this evening, and you are among the indifferent or the hostile, but God is working in your heart, and God is humbling you, and God is revealing to you your sin and your separation, and saying, come, come to me. Seek me while I may be found. I invite you to pray this prayer along with me. Just your heart talking to God, so I silently pray along with me this evening, saying, Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. <coughs> I've said things, I've thought things, I've done things that I know are wrong. I've broken your laws, and I know I've broken your heart. Jesus, I believe that you lived a perfect life. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I believe that you rose in the third day for my salvation. And now, Jesus, as I'm sinking beneath the waves, I reach up and I call out to you. Save me. Save me, Jesus. You have promised. Everyone who calls out to you will be saved. I desire to follow you and worship you and seek you as I give you thanks for my salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you pray with me tonight to Trust in Jesus, turning from your sin, trusting in Him. I pray that you'll talk to me that we can pray together. If you're like myself and you want to live 2020 for Jesus and really make it count and seek Him, I, I pray for you. I hope you'll be praying for me that we will worship Him above all else. And we're going to sing this song as we get ready for communion. We three kings of Orient are. Would anyone like to help me sing? Anybody at all want to come up and sing? All right, come on. If you want to sing, just stand right up here in front of our Christmas candles. This is our last chance to sing the Christmas carol. Don't knock <laughs> over the camera. Here we go. Let's sing together. We three kings. Everybody stand as we sing. Oh, can we turn up number five on the soundboard? Thank you. Other? Yes. Thank Daniel, get it. Daniel's boy it is. <laughs>
Well, someone, I think everything has to go way too loud back there. Okay. Oh, my ears. All right, here we go. You guys ready? <laughs> oh. Jesus, we confess our sins, trusting that you are faithful, you are just, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You said upon the cross, it is finished, paid in full, the receipt that we owe stamped, you completed the work and paid everything necessary, and we thank you, and even now we commit to making things right with those that we have harmed, to releasing bitterness, 
towards those who have harmed us, and to seeking forgiveness and reconciliation where that is possible. As much as it depends upon us, may we live at peace with all people. We fix the eyes of our hearts upon Jesus, thanking you for his body broken and his blood shed, as we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Whenever you are ready, you can come forward and take the bread and the cup back to your seats, and we will partake together as one of the bread and then of the cup.